Waterbury, Connecticut. Founded in the late 17th century, this formerly thriving factory city, nicknamed the Brass City, has been slowly deteriorating since its manufacturing peak following World War II. Waterbury is also known for its prevalent Catholicism. The Knights of Columbus, a still prominent Catholic fraternal organization, was founded there in 1881, and the country's first Bible-themed theme park opened there in 1957. Although the park closed in 1984, its legacy is still clear with a giant cross towering over the city where the attraction used to stand. What most people don't know is that Waterbury has had a significant Jewish population since the first Jewish immigrants arrived there from Germany in the 1840s. I made it my mission to find out more about the mysterious history of the Jews in this unlikely enclave of America. By 1870, Waterbury's Jewish community was composed of about 15 German families. Isidore Chase seems to be a prime example of this group. Chase, born in 1852, immigrated to the United States at age 14. He and his older brother opened up a millinery store in Waterbury, and he began taking a very active role in the city as a whole and its Jewish community. He served a term on the city's Board of Finance, and spent over 20 years on the Board of Education. He also helped found the first synagogue in Waterbury, Temple Israel, and formed the Waterbury chapters of the Jewish social groups Melchai Zedek and B'nai B'rith. By 1890, there are more than 60 Jewish families in Waterbury, mostly of Eastern European descent, and there is a need for a more observant, or an Orthodox synagogue in the city. After the establishment of this congregation, called Aguda Sachim, the city became more accommodating for Jews of all religious backgrounds, and the Jewish population grew accordingly. At the end of the century, Waterbury's Jewish heyday is already in full swing. A third synagogue, Beth Israel, is opened in 1905, and Sheris Israel is founded in 1909. Soon, there are dozens of Jewish-affiliated and Yiddish-speaking clubs in Waterbury, and the city is home to two part-time Hebrew schools and a Jewish day school called the Waterbury Hebrew Institute. Let's take a look at Mr. Milton Kadish, a native Jewish Waterburyan born during the 1920s, who I think embodies Waterbury's Jewish community's ideal citizen of the 20th century. Kadish was very involved in the Jewish community. He served as president of a synagogue, helped found a Jewish day school, and was active in a group called Brotherhood in Action, which brought together Jewish and African-American men through service activities. Outside of the Jewish community, he served on Waterbury's public school board for 20 years and was a prominent accountant in the city. As the years went on, more Jewish establishments came and went. Jewish newspapers, kosher butchers, and Jewish fraternities all graced Waterbury for a period of time or another. However, unfortunately for its residents, Waterbury's Jewish community eventually began to disappear. It is unclear exactly when this decline began, but most of the people that I spoke to estimated that the community's peak was soon after World War II, right as the city was in its manufacturing peak. Slowly, the greater Waterbury Jewish community, once an estimated 1,600 families strong, started deteriorating. By 1975, Waterbury's Jewish population was smaller than that of 50 years before. The two Orthodox synagogues officially merged in 1969 due to low membership rates. The Reform Synagogue was sold to a Mormon church. The Conservative Synagogue, Bethel, was preparing its move out into the more drawing suburbs that had unknowingly destroyed a once thriving community. So the situation was one where every was Peter and God was going down. There are several factors that caused this migration. But then people start moving out into the suburbs. Well, it, it, primarily, I guess, it was economics uh, in one case. Uh, uh, where the people with means decided they moved, they wanted to live in a better area, so they moved from Waterbury to West, from the central Waterbury to the western sections of Waterbury, and then continued out west until the bulk of it was south or in the, in the Southbury area. 
That's exactly right. What both Mr. Goldberg and Mrs. Kadish mentioned, suburbanization, was a huge factor in Waterbury's diminishing Jewish population. The suburbanization was due to more affluent citizens in a growingly less wealthy city, safety purposes, as certain Waterbury neighborhoods took a turn for the worse, and, eventually, just because everyone else seemed to be doing it. In the late 1990s, Judaism in Waterbury seemed to be losing hope. The conservative synagogue was no longer holding regular services. The Orthodox synagogue met only once a week. The only meeting they had was on Shabbos. The Orthodox shul at 9.30 start, and they extended the prayers, Shacharit and Musaf, that they were able to have a Kiddush and then Dav and Mincha. Essentially, the Orthodox synagogue had only one extended service a week, instead of the traditional three times a day. Soon, however, the Jewish community's rejuvenation came. Uh, Rabbi Harris, Judah Harris, a colleague of mine, uh, was the Orthodox Rav in Waterbury. And this goes back just over a dozen years, a little bit longer than that. And Rabbi Harris was seeing the diminution of the Orthodox community within uh, Waterbury and realized that the best way of bringing back an Orthodox community would be through schooling. And he pursued uh, um, a creating a relationship with Torah and Masorah, which is uh, ultimately the group which was sponsoring the yeshiva, which then came into Waterbury. In the summer of 2000, nine Jewish families came to Waterbury with the intention of establishing a yeshiva, or a school where Torah is studied, to revitalize the formerly flourishing Jewish community. They soon established the yeshiva, and 35 pupils came to Waterbury to study. The community immediately thrived and began attracting more families and students. So I think the spirit of pioneerism and doing something together and working together in the environment of a yeshiva created a tremendous, tremendous positive energy. And when people, people used to join us for Shabbos and just never leave. These new immigrants to Waterbury had no problems making it into their home. But they brought everything they needed. We have um, Jewish ambulance service. They brought in an Arab, so, which was important for them because on Shabbos you can't carry. They could push the baby carriages, they could carry the mikvah, they brought in, a, you know, they built a mikvah. Um, they, kosher food is, is very um, easy to obtain here. The 1,000 new members of Waterbury's Jewish community are doing whatever they can to turn the city into their home. Take Fulton Park, for example. The park surrounds the yeshiva community and was in awful shape when they arrived, filled with overgrown areas, abandoned buildings, and laden with drugs and prostitution. But, the leaders of the yeshiva community were sought out by determined local citizens to help make a change. There was definitely a common ground because what you see now is not what this park started out. The Jewish citizens and their non-Jewish neighbors immediately began restoring the park. And everybody worked side by side, ate, played, you know, shared all their experiences. Because this, was the com this ended up being the common ground for all of us. The now beautified Fulton Park stands as a tangibility of many of the Jewish accomplishments in Waterbury. The cleanup showed the integration and trust that they have with their neighbors. The fact that the Jews were over one half of the cleanup personnel shows their carrying out of their responsibilities as citizens, and they practice their rights by identifying a problem in their greater community and deciding to make a change. They further exercise their rights by practicing religion how they so choose, and by giving their children a private education. However, they also carry out the responsibilities as Americans by paying taxes, being productive members of society, and by helping out in their community like they did at Fulton Park. And looking back at Waterbury's secular Jewish community, the case seems to be the same. Jews in Waterbury have always exercised their rights by forming synagogues and exclusively Jewish social groups, but have also been very integrated into the city as a whole as well. Like Isidore Chase and Milton Kadish. They were both involved in Waterbury politics and had productive jobs of their own, but they were both also very dedicated to the Jewish community. From the beginning, Jews in Waterbury exercised their rights and abided by their responsibilities as Americans, even as the Jewish demographic changed.